Some games are fantastic and spawn franchises that are, hmm, you know, not great. Sometimes it's not till the second or third before they get their groove going, too. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 game franchises with only one good game. Starting out at number 10, it's Titanfall, the original Titanfall, was an interesting proof of concept with some pretty solid fundamentals, but it was missing a lot of the modes and features that people come to expect from a game like this. It wasn't terrible by any stretch, but it had some pretty big holes in the design that could be shored up by a sequel, and that's pretty much what happened. Multiplayer options were expanded, it got the fantastic single-player campaign the franchise deserves, and it was just an all-around complete product. The sequel was an absolute slam dunk. It was and still is one of the best, most dynamic multiplayer shooters out there. The real tragedy here, it's not that, yes, there's one good game in the series. Uh, it's not that the first one is bad, though, because it's not bad. It's just, it's not a complete game. It's missing some very key aspects of it, and that makes it so that Titanfall 2 is the one quote-unquote good game here. However, that's, again, not the tragedy. The tragedy is we don't have a Titanfall 3. It's been seven years. Like, throw us a, a bone here. I, I realize that Respawn has been busy with the Star Wars Jedi games and Apex Legends, but Titanfall needs a life preserver. Titanfall 2's on life support. The servers barely work, which is just tragic because this is the one series that came actually close to being a Call of Duty killer. It had the gameplay, it had the innovation, and if only EA actually supported it, right? Maybe that's an oversimplification, I, I don't know. The game ended up not being as popular as the devs or EA expected or something like that. Obviously, there's a reason they focus more time on Apex. It's the moneymaker, but even Apex has a lot of Titanfall DNA in it, does it not? I think this, this series has a lot of life in it and deserves more. And number nine is Crackdown. Man, the first Crackdown game was so good. It was pretty simple by modern standards. I mean, even kind of simple by 2007 standards, but it was really fun. You played as an agent with a simple mission of taking out three crime syndicates in the city with extreme violence, and that's it. That's the game. Actually, the real game was collecting these orbs. The sound they make when you get them is so satisfying, and the more you get, the tougher your agent becomes. And it makes for a satisfying gameplay loop where you're always making forward momentum. Seems like a game that could easily get expanded on or just create another city with new types of enemies, guns, and whatnot, and you're good. Uh, the first Crackdown was made by Real Time Worlds, former GTA developers who went on to make the uh, Notorious Bomb APB. So, yeah, they didn't make the sequel. Instead, development was handed off to Ruffian Games. And you'd think they'd have, like, the easiest layup of all time with this, with this sequel, but, um... Crackdown 2, they botched it. Oh, it's a botch job. I mean, it's hard to describe how lame and dull Crackdown 2 is compared to the original. They cut out the unique bosses and custom layers for these copy-pasted nests where you complete boring stand-in-the-circle objectives while shooting generic zombies. Turning the sequel into a zombie apocalypse, kind of interesting, but mostly comes off as an excuse to reuse most of the original map and make everything uglier. The third game, which was in development hell for years until it finally came out in 2019 wasn't terrible but it was extremely out of date compared to contemporary open world games it felt like something from a different era and it's overall closer to what we would have wanted for a crackdown sequel but it's just nowhere as good as the fantastic first game and number eight is perfect dark the original perfect dark was a brilliant um spiritual sequel to golden eye it took everything about that game and made it better multiplayer was better campaign missions were better visuals were staggering for a nintendo 64 game and it was just an all-around improvement and a great starting place for the franchise i am not sure what stopped rare from making a sequel sooner but it wasn't until the launch of the xbox 360 that did we finally get a follow-up called perfect dark zero if you were around back when then there's not a lot to say the game was a massive disappointment, didn't hold the candles of the first Perfect Dark at all. The gameplay was weird and janky, the missions felt very outdated compared to the FPS games at the time, and the graphics were odd. Rare was going for a more cartoony look in this game, in contrast to general realism, 
you know, how they went for the first one. And it really didn't, it did not fit. A lot of people got Zero as part of a console bundle or on release day and just hated it. I played it back then and I, I soldiered through, but as much as I said to myself it wasn't that bad, I'm older now, the wounds are not so fresh, and I am perfectly fine admitting Perfect Dark Zero just sucked. Microsoft is attempting to reboot the series. It got announced a few years ago, and we haven't really seen any actual trailers. So, the franchise is effectively dead. If and when it finally does get revived, I hope the next game isn't crap like Perfect Dark Zero. Uh, but it really, it couldn't be worse. They'd really have to try. And number seven is Mercenaries. The first Mercenaries game by Pandemic is one of the all-time great open-world action games. Came out fully formed and totally unique right out of the gate. What makes this one so much fun is how you can use uh, and hijack military vehicles like tanks and helicopters. You can also get your pick smoke grenades to call in artillery barrages, laser designators to call in missile airstrikes. You can get bunker busters, carpet bombing. And it's not just for show, you can demolish whole towns with the press of a button. It's crazy satisfying and sets you off against Im impossible odds. But, uh, but it does give you the tools to beat them. The entire support weapon system is one of the best things in the game, but there's a lot of interesting ideas put into that first game, like how each playable character can speak a different language, which allows them to understand everything that one of the factions says. They could have just made it so you play as one guy, but they wanted to innovate, so they made an already great game better. The sequel, however, feels worse in almost every way. The setting, yeah, it's more visually interesting, but the story has been dumbed down considerably. The whole support strike system is less effective, it's harder to use, and the game Gameplay just isn't as challenging or compelling for that matter. It also feels really rushed. It's, it was buggy in a way that the first game really wasn't. It was just a disappointing follow-up to the stellar original, and that was it for the franchise. The devs of Pandemic did a lot of good work expanding the possibilities of open-world games. Like, these games still do stuff I saw in more open-world games like Environmental Destruction, but the sequel was so rushed and half-baked it just killed the franchise. And number six, here's another franchise that died after just two games, only in this case the sequel was the good one. The first Red Steel had one thing going for it. It was a first person shooter designed for Nintendo Wii. This was a system that with its motion controls was literally built for first person shooter games and it never got as many as it deserved. The original Red Steel came out to a lot of hype, but not good reviews. The controls were awkward, the sword fighting was lame, and the story was lamer. Uh, most of the design was pretty dull and drab, too. The first Red Steel was pretty much what you'd expect from a 2006 Ubisoft game. Plot was generic, and there just wasn't much to get players invested outside of the novelty of using motion controls to shoot and swing a sword. The game sold pretty well, so the developers got a chance to address the complaints and ended up making one of the best Ubisoft games of all time. It cannot be understated just how big of an improvement Red Steel 2 was. The art direction, the controls, the gameplay, it was all way better. Instead of being set in dull hotels and office buildings fighting generic Yakuza thugs, Red Steel 2's setting is completely different. It's Wild West mixed with a samurai movie. Instead of dry stock combat where you're just wagging a sword at enemies, the gameplay is really tight, challenging, and rewarding. No exaggeration, the combat system in Red Steel 2 is one of the best ever. It is so satisfying, and there is really nothing else quite like it. No other game makes use of the Wii's motion controls like this one, and that's why it came packed in with the Wii Motion Plus attachment. It made the game's controls even more responsive. It's one of the best games on the Wii, while the original maybe isn't one of the worst. I mean, there's a lot of bad games on the Wii, but it was still pretty bad. And number five is Final Fight. Now, this might be a little controversial, but hear me out. How many of you even knew that there were more games after Final Fight? The game was an absolute classic. One of the all-time great beat-em-ups. The Super Nintendo version was inferior, but still uh, an all-time great game. And many characters introduced in this game, like Hagar, Guide, and Cody, all ended up in Street Fighter. For most people, Final Fight ended with that first game. But they made two sequels on the Super Nintendo. The first one was forgettable, just more of the same. Well, the third game tried to make some improvements and modernize the formula a bit, but in the process made the game way too easy and kind of not worth playing. 
Also, it came out at the end of the Super Nintendo's life cycle, so barely any copies actually got on the store shelves, and the game was almost immediately forgotten. Uh, that didn't stop Capcom from making a few more games. They made Final Fight Revenge on the Sega Saturn, which is terrible. Like, the last boss rises out of the ground and fights you as a zombie, because, well, whatever. That was bad, but the real nadir of the series was its gritty reboot, Final Fight Streetwise. Uh, one of the many, many games trying to piggyback on the success of Grand Theft Audio and the Warriors from Rockstar. It tries to be mature, and it's embarrassing. The story is terrible, the fighting is stiff and awkward, it's just a bad game. It's best forgotten about. The actual Final Fight sequels on the SNES aren't terrible or anything, they're okay, but the original game is the only one that really stands out as a classic. Uh, maybe Mighty Final Fight on the NES wasn't bad either, but it was basically a demake rather than a new game. And number four is Fear. We spent more than enough time waxing about the um, original Fear and what makes it so great on this channel. It's one of the best FPSs of all time. Enemy AI is brilliant. Guns feel powerful in a way few video game guns do. Horror elements give it a creepy edge and it just keeps itself interesting in all of the time, whether it's the immaculate shootouts or even the downtime. <laughs> There's only one problem, it was a PC exclusive. These days there's a parody between console and PC games, but back then you couldn't make a game like the original Fear for consoles, and it would have to be dumbed down. And that's what we got with Fear 2 Project Origin. Uh, it's not the worst game in the franchise, but it's not nearly as good as the first game. Instead of being able to carry four guns, you're limited to a Call of Duty style inventory. Movement was slower, enemies were dumber, arenas were less interesting. It was just a less exciting game overall. It wasn't irredeemable, but good, not what I would call it. Fear 2 was really hurt by being made for consoles over PC, but just like with Driv 3R, for 3 r is where the series really dropped off the face of the earth. Development went from monolith to these nobodies at day one studios, and you can immediately tell that things are different. The visuals are way worse. The story is somehow goofier and edgier. It's, it's, it's worse in every possible way. The only interesting thing about it is the unique co-op mechanics, which one player is a point man, the other is Ghost Paxton from the first game, and he plays completely differently. It's cool as far as a co-op shooter goes, but it's just not up to the standards of Fear 2. And as I said, Fear 2 really wasn't good in comparison to Fear 1. So, yeah. At number three is Stuntman, a PS2 game with realistic handling, uh, physics, uh, an interesting twist. Very different driving game. Ultimately, it received kind of meager popularity because it had uh, a very punishing difficulty level. Stuntman Ignition, released as a console bridging title, PS2, PS3, and 360, featured a uh, very different overhauled game system that keeps the difficulty intact, but did make it more fair, and it was also a much better looking game. Like, do you remember the infuriating tutorial from the first Driver game? Well, if we took that and made an entire game out of it, it's Stuntman. It's not as bad as the description would imply, though. It's just a huge pain in the ass. The basic premise is that you're a stunt driver performing car sequences for a movie. So you start driving and the director calls out instructions. The car handling is very realistic and very unforgiving, so only a few mistakes will fail the whole run and you gotta start over. It's one of those games where you just have to trial and error your way through. And while there is a certain appeal there, the game is too frustrating for its own good. The drive visuals on PS2 didn't help, uh, but the follow-up was way, way better. Stuntman Ignition took the original game and gave it a burnout coat of paint. Everything bigger, faster, more intense, more fun. Uh, it all added up well. Instead of starting with the very basic car chases in a gray London, Ignition starts with a volcano disaster movie. Um, how they are making and filming this, I don't know, but it is a much more entertaining setting. And it still basically boils down to a series of obstacle courses, but they're a lot more fun and vibrant to play. It's all such a ridiculous spectacle that it's, it's enjoyable. And it's especially enjoyable when you consider that the first stuntman was very similar, but was just too frustrating to be enjoyable. Jump over the rubble! And number two is Call of Juarez. Most of the time, mediocre franchises like this never really rise beyond their humble beginnings. 
The first Call of Juarez is, is very weird and very janky. Uh, the sequel, Bound in Blood, was better, but mostly still forgettable. It was kind of just another brown and gray cowboy adventure. Techland tried to go big with the third game and pulled the Call of Duty and brought the series to the modern day with a game called Call of Juarez the Cartel, but it didn't really work. Compared to the big AAA games, the game just did not hold up, and the controversial subject matter mostly left people annoyed. Most of the time, a high-profile failure like that would be the end of a franchise, but instead of just closing up shop, the devs decided to take the series in a completely different direction and ended up making easily the best game in the series. Just one look at Gunslinger, and you can tell how refreshingly different it is compared to the three previous games in the series. Where the old games were brown and gray, Gunslinger is just vibrant, colorful, beautiful even. Where the old games are filled with dry, leaden dialogue, Gunslinger's clever. The game's just fun, it's well designed, got great mechanics, and it was cheap. Call of Juarez Gunslinger was a great time, and it's unfortunate it never got a follow-up after Techland got the massive success of the Dying Light series. But, hey, we're lucky we got it. I mean, fourth time is not usually the charm. Usually it's three strikes, you're out. But, I mean, Call of Juarez Gunslinger. <laughs> And finally, Watch Dogs. Let's end this one with uh, probably the most controversial pick. The first Watch Dogs game isn't that bad, uh, but it's saddled with some liabilities that prevent it from being truly good. Uh, an overly serious story, a very flat protagonist, and a less than inspired open world version of Chicago. Like, there's aspects of it that are good, but it got downgraded pretty significantly, and I do think that that didn't help. Other than the hacking gimmick and the multiplayer invasions where rival hackers can ambush you while playing the game, it sticks too close to the Ubisoft formula and it kind of suffers from it. The third game, Watch Dogs Legion, had a revolutionary idea by making it so you could play as literally anybody in the city of London. It's a great idea. And it could have been amazing, but Ubisoft and the devs clearly got cold feet at some point and simplified the entire recruitment mechanic, so it doesn't really matter. For me, and for a lot of people, the Watch Dog game that really distinguishes itself as great is the second game. The hacking mechanics were greatly expanded. You could control a drone or an RC car at will, so there's actually a lot of freedom in how to accomplish objectives in the game. The city of San Francisco, beautifully recreated, filled with all these amazing little details. It's one of the only open world cities actually rival to a Rockstar game in terms of attention to detail. The music is fantastic, and the story, while not amazing or anything, um, is better than Vigilante Uncle looking for revenge. Uh, none of the Watch Dogs games are terrible in my opinion, but the second one just came together to make something truly good. CTOS tagged him as the prime suspect in a high-tech burglary, so... I've also got a bonus game for you here, True Crime. There's, there's only one great game in the True Crime series. It's called Sleeping Dogs. Originally called True Crime Hong Kong, Sleeping Dogs was meant to be the next game in the series before it was canceled by Activision. Um, it's actually even kind of convoluted. It wasn't even originally developed as that. It was being developed uh, as a game called Black Lotus. And after a year of development, Activision changed it to a true crime game and then canceled it later and then square enix got the publishing rights uh not the true crime name though so they changed it to sleeping dogs it's got a bizarre story that is only technically part of the true crime franchise but that's good enough for me it's definitely the most fun polished game compared to streets of la or streets of new york sleeping dogs may not have wizards that transform into dragons or christopher walken uh, but it makes up for it by being a fantastic game. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.